Hi guys, welcome to my microbiology presentation and in this presentation I'll be covering the microflora. So the learning objectives are to learn about the normal microflora of the human body and to discuss the normal microflora present in different areas of the body. So to start off with, what is a microflora? Well a microflora could be a symbiotic relationship between bacteria and the human body. This means that we both benefit from living and being in contact with each other. Or it can also include that bacteria which naturally reside in slash on the human body. Okay, so examples where we've got a microflora are the skin, the gastrointestinal tract, the mouth, also known as the oral cavity, the respiratory tract, and the urogenital tract. Just a little fact, there are actually more bacteria cells in slash on our body than there are actual human cells. Okay, just take a moment to process that piece of information. That's a large amount of bacterial cells in us and on us most of which are actually in the GI tract. We get colonized at birth, and most microorganisms are non-disease causing, say about 95%-ish are non-disease causing, but some are opportunistic, which means that it can be potential pathogens. So these include like C. difficile, E. coli, and Staphylococcus aureus. So these all grow where we've got a selective microenvironment. So the body supply is a favorable environment for bacteria, but it is not entirely safe for bacterial growth as some areas are hostile. So for example, we've got mucous membranes which provide protection, we've got antibodies floating about, destroying, well not destroying, but capturing bacteria, macrophages going around, causing phagocytosis, stomach acid which can just degrade bacteria, and our skin is really harsh, exposed to high temperatures, low temperatures, wind, abrasion, and also radiation, which obviously comes from the sun. So we can start off talking about the microflora of the skin. So the skin is a dry, acidic, and hostile environment which does not support the growth of microorganisms. The only possible locations where bacteria can actually colonize are sweat glands and other moist areas in which gram-positive bacteria can survive. You get transient bacteria which, inoc which can inoculate, but they cannot mul multiply. These include gram-negatives such as E. coli. Then you get resident bacteria. So these can actually survive and multiply. So that includes like staphylococcus and gram negatives because they can survive the harsh condition conditions. And also you can get a few fungi. So you can get about five different species of yeast on the skin as well. Now we're gonna move on to the microflora of the oral cavity. So this is a heterogeneous micro microbial habitat, which basically means it's both hostile and favorable. So it's hostile because we've got antimicrobial enzymes in saliva such as lysozyme and lactoperoxidase and also we've got hydrogen peroxide in our saliva. But on the other hand, it's also got high concentrations of nutrients. So like when we eat food, some of these dissolved nutrients and stuff, they won't actually get into our digestive tract, they'll actually just sit dissolved in our mouth. And this is where you can get bacterial growth. So one example of this is dental plaque. This here is a picture of dental plaque combined with decalcification of the teeth. So, bacteria can colonize the two surfaces by attaching to acidic glycoproteins which get deposited there by saliva. When you get extensive growth of this bacteria, or more in particular streptococci, that's where you get this thick white bacterial layer here which is called dental plaque. As this gets thicker, underneath you can get um, anaerobic bacteria species begin to colonize. As a result, these can then produce acid, or lactic acids, which can then cause decalcification of the tooth, and therefore leading towards tooth decay. So, and the two main sort of bacteria that cause this are Streptococcus mutans and Streptococcus sobrinus. So just a question that I want to direct to you. Why do diets higher in sugar encourage lactic acid producing bacteria? And also, how does fluoride in mouthwash and toothpaste prevent these? Just a little thing to think about. Now we're going to move on to the microflora of the GI tract. So this consists of the stomach, the small intestines, and the large intestines. So in the stomach we get lactobacilli mainly. Then as we progress down towards the small intestines we get enterococci and lactobacilli. Then when we get to the large intestines you get a large amount of bacteria. You get enterobacteria, enterococci, bacteroids, bifidobacterium, eubacterium, peptococcus, peptostreptococcus, it's a typo, ruminococcus, Clostridia and Lactobacilli. These carry out essential met metabolic reactions to produce various compounds. So they can synthesize certain vitamins for us. As a side product, they can produce gas and odor, which isn't very pleasant. 
It can also produce some, some useful organic acids and some useful enzymes. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the microflora of the respiratory tract. So this consists of the upper and the lower tract. So in the upper, we've got the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, the pharynx and the larynx. Then in the lower tract, we've got the trachea, the primary bronchus, secondary bronchus, respiratory um, bronchi, bronchioles, terminal bronchus and the alveoli. So the microflora we get in our upper tract includes those that are bathed by secretions and these can enter from the air. And these include just your basic staphylococcus and streptococcus. Then as we go to the lower, it, it is usually sterile, but because the airflow slows down, organisms can actually settle on the walls of the tract. So these include that streptococcus pneumoniae, which eventually cause pneumonia. Now we're going to move on to the urogenital tract. So the bladder is theoretically should be sterile. However, if there are any changes in pH, this can cause opportunistic bacteria to become pathogenic. So for example, E. coli and Proteus mirabilis. And these two bacteria are the primary cause of urinary tract infections in women. So just an emerging thing that's, that's recently started to occur. E. coli, which is one of the primary causes of urinary tract infections, is actually becoming resistant to antibiotics. And as a result, those who are actually suffering with urinary tract infections, they're no longer able to receive antibiotics because they're just not working anymore. And finally, we're just going to talk about the microflora of the vagina. So it is weakly acidic and it also contains a high amounts of glycogen, which cause lactobacillus acidophilus to ferment these, the glycogen and produce lactic acid. And this forms a protective environment. And having this weak acidic environment actually can cause some bacteria to die and denature or whatnot. Other organisms that you can find around there, it also includes yeast, some streptococci and E. coli. And that's it, we've come to the end. So now we come to the test yourself section. So here I'm going to ask you four questions. I'm going to allocate a certain amount of marks which, it, which the question will be worth. I'm not going to tell you how to get the marks, I'm going to leave that to you to figure out. So the first question, which of these bacteria are not found in the GI tract? C. difficile, E. coli, S. mutans or L. acidophilus. Describe the microflora of the skin and explain how it is a hostile environment to most bacteria for 10 marks. And again for 10 marks, describe and explain how the oral cavity is both hostile and favourable to the growth of bacteria and explain how tooth decay forms as a result of bacterial colonisation. And then here we've got an essay style question for 25 marks. Describe two different normal microflora present in slash on the body and at least two examples of microorganisms present in each floor. So that's it. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation, guys, and good luck revising for the exams. Peace out.